right. So this morning we have uh, with us uh, uh, Chris Kadamian, Al Gauthier, Dave Clark, TJ Gentry, Jonathan Kruger, Eric Salee, Chris Kadamian, Darren Mellorine, uh, Eric, I think that's it. Did I get everyone? We're going to include Logan this morning. Logan Logan. Okay. He's on his run. Anyway, <laughs> we our first question today um, actually comes from Gary Winus, but he's not with us. Um, as to protective gear, padding, and armory in the ancient Greek Olympics, men fought naked as they were born. Okay, well, we have to have a reality check there. Um, that's not socially acceptable today. <laughs> <laughs> in most contests in most contests <laughs> but anyway the, 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 there is an issue of protective gear padding and armory um, most I, I, I'll speak up for our, my dojo and, and we, just in, in terms of way Seki was um, he, re, he required that we, you know, we wear a cup he encourage brown belts and up to wear uh, the, the, the foam type the foam type padding forearm and back of the hand shin and instep padding the, the, the soft cotton stuff the really inexpensive padding um, just as a matter of protection um, and because of the forearm padding you can turn it around so when you when one person was practicing hits, you get a, a double padding effect on the blocking. Um, I think uh, uh, there, there are two sides to padding, protective gear. Uh, one, one, it can protect you from some of the owies, okay, because you don't bruise as easily. Um, the other side of the coin is that it can give you a how to say false sense of security. Um, and I, I found what I, what would happen occasionally in Seki's class is if we didn't wear padding, we rarely learned very fast. We had to cut back on how hard we blocked um, and things of that sort, because when you do wear padding, you, you do tend to, uh, um, you tend to you tend to be more aggressive with your blocking. Um, now that, that's what you need. You need to have aggressive. I forgot who I was talking to for, to the other day. Uh, uh, what's his name? Dave Bellman, who's out here in Southern California, who is a strong believer in good. You have to have good blocking skills. I mean, you're either going to block or deflect. But if you're going to block, you have to stop what's ever coming at you, and. Uh, the, the protective gear helps build that skill. And if you learn to block hard, if you block someone hard, for lack of a better phrase, it isn't going to hurt you as much as it hurts the person you're blocking. Um, because hopefully you're going to block at the correct angle. Um, I have seen in one situation when I taught junior high school, uh, one of my brown belt kids almost talked his way out of a fight. And his, his one stupid move, which he recognized real fast, was that he turned around and walked away from his attacker rather than backing away. And the his attacker tried a roundhouse sucker punch from the rear. But my student saw it and blocked it. And it actually broke the other kid's arm, um, which always surprised a lot of people. And... Uh, School policy was that if two kids got in a fight, they were both suspended. But there were even teachers that were, saw this besides me, and they said he never fought. All he did was block the hit. So the other kid went away to the hospital, and my kid stayed in school. Um, so, you know, a good block does work. And my feeling, even after all the years, one of the best ways to learn effective blocking is to wear padding. Uh, anyway, any, any other thoughts on protective gear or now the other side of the coin is one other area. 
when I first started teaching jujitsu before the AJA picked up the insurance policy many decades ago, uh, the first time I picked up, we, we had insurance, the insurance company, because we were teaching jujitsu, they wanted us to have body patty, forearm patty, back of hand, shin, form. they even wanted us to wear headgear. And I said, I'm sorry, all of that equipment is a safety hazard in jujitsu. And they said, why? And I said, because you cannot feel what your attack, your attacker's body movements. And so what's going to happen is students are going to be more aggressive and you're going to have a higher injury rate. And so they said, you mean to tell us without that gear, we're going to have a lower injury rate? And I said, yes. So they said, well, we'll try you for a year and see what happens. And we didn't have any injuries. So they said, no problem. So in case you want a real background on why the insurance company doesn't require protective gear, uh, it's because we have an extremely low injury rate. Okay. But anyway, back to protective gear. Anyone have any other thoughts on, on it or ideas? If you don't mind, I can go ahead and uh, get started on that with the whole protective gear. Um, now, uh, I'll, first, I want to start off with headgear. Uh, I don't think I don't think it, it is a necessity. If anything, sometimes it can be uh, a hazard because if you if you have a protective headgear, it is at, adding not only uh, a little bit of extra weight on top of your head. Um, it um, is also size, and that's uh, that's two parts of that. And then the third part is. Um, whoever your, your, your sparring partner is, it's like like you said, they get a little bit more aggressive. Now they, they hit you a certain way, all that extra weight is going to add uh, add to more of the the ripping motion on um, on your head, on your neck. So uh, you can actually get uh, a little bit more uh, concussive energy, uh, concussive uh, injuries, uh, just from having that uh, the head gear. Um, now, when it comes when it comes to uh, uh, hand protection, I sometimes I would use boxing gloves if, if I'm doing uh, just a general um, striking session, a little boxing or kickboxing, whatever. But uh, it's either I'm if if it's ju uh, jujitsu related, it's either I'm going to wear uh, nothing, uh, nothing on, on my forearms. I uh, over time I I develop uh, uh, enough uh, uh, toughness on on my forearms and on my hand to, to where uh, uh, some of these blocks don't uh, don't really hurt me that much. They hurt they hurt my training partner, especially if I do it correctly and it's, there's a bit of a, a snap or in karate what, what they call it a, a kime. Um, but. Uh, in general, uh, forearm pads, uh, I haven't used those since I was a kid. Um, now, in regards to the uh, the gloves, I am going to be investing in what's, what's called a, uh, a hybrid uh, hybrid MMA glove. It's basically a, a, a lot. It's like a seven-ounce padding on, on top of, uh, of your knuckles, but I still have my, uh, my fingers, so I can incorporate... Uh, striking and grappling while keeping myself and my partner safe. Um, body armor, I don't really, uh, I don't really uh, uh, worry about that. You need to learn how to, how to take a hit. And plus, it does uh, get in, in the way of certain techniques that say um, uh, tomanage. Uh, if, if, my, if my partner is trying to do uh, a tomanage on me, the, the body armor is just going to get in the way. And you need you need to de uh, start developing that accuracy. That's another thing that I um, I forgot to mention with the the hybrid gloves. Boxing gloves are, are big and bulky. Uh, in a street fight, you're not gonna you're gonna you're not gonna have that luxury of blocking that uh, blocking like this and expecting that to co uh, cover a fist uh, a fist size instead of a, a boxing glove. This this little opening right here. Um, will we'll stop a, a, a glove, but can it necessarily stop the fist? 
So uh, you need to uh, you need to be able to uh, train uh, those realities. So uh, so it, it, if if I'm blocking like like this, and I can stop at this, that means my uh, my my block is a lot tighter. Uh, uh, things about nature, shin guards. Uh, sometimes we use them uh, if if I'm going to be checking kick. Uh, yeah, I want to. I want to have them because uh, uh, bone on bone shin checks, especially if they hit a certain spot, ooh, they they hurt for weeks. Uh, so, uh, so yes, I had, uh, having certain protections um, can be a necessity, but you need to uh, if you're going to forego uh, or not not use any uh, protection. You need to under, uh, you need to uh, accept the risk that that comes with it. <clears throat> uh, so that that is my two cents on on that topic. Okay. Any anyone else? I would say something uh, just uh, briefly. Uh, there's a product out there uh, called Shock Doctor that is an outstanding uh, uh, system for um, providing a cup protection haven't checked into it uh, as a sensei i recommend it and uh, i've taught classes um without a cup but um <laughs> i'll tell you what I, there's no question that you're a whole lot safer in randori uh with one and i recommend the shock doctor um because it's the best system i've seen out there so check into it if, if uh, you're a sensei an active sensei okay uh, uh, go ahead well, first of all, thank you for allowing me in. <laughs> I've been very busy over the last what seven or eight weeks, but but I, but I am back participating. Um, we I think starting at the beginning is like is protective you know protection protective gear essential to the martial arts and in general, and then specifically jujitsu, if you could if we could uh, define it, narrowly define it like that. The answer is obviously absolutely yes. And I think that um, the more gear, the more protective gear you need is based on, you know, what type, of, what, what are you doing? Are you doing more 50-50 uh, uh, Randuri versus uh, uh, Kata? Um, so I think that some of this has, has to play with the type of gear that you, um, that you accumulate. You know, cup, mouth guard, uh, uh, protective eye eyewear. I think th those three are on the on the fundamental uh, male female uh, cup. Uh, you know, is gender neutral and, and and glasses because people can get poked in the eyes. So you need those things. Uh, even if you don't use sticks, you still have your fingers that put you at put you at risk. Mouth guard the same way. Accidents do happen, even though you. You know that that <laughs> there's always an opportunity to uh, to get hit in the mouth, and so that's that's my two cents. Thank you. One one thing I'd like to mention, and that is, uh, uh, and I'll go back to when I taught jujitsu in junior high, and I also well, all the other teaching, other places where I, where I teach it. Um, on average. I, well, let me put this here. I will have, I try not to have my students use protective gear. I'd like to have them start using it up around brown belt to improve their blocking. Um, when they're going to strike a person, I like to have them close enough so that their fist actually stops about an inch or two in front of the Tory's face. <laughs> um, because it's, it's, that's a pretty good reality check. That's a that's close enough to worry seriously, and it tends to make students uh, block more effectively because that fist is pretty close. On average, it hasn't happened in the past few years, but on average, if I didn't get hit in the mouth once a year, there was something wrong um, when I was teaching techniques and. Uh, I kind of would say to my students, although I don't wish this on anyone, you need to get hit in the face once in a while because you need to know what it, part of your 
learning your self-defense is you need to know what it feels like so that you don't get really, I forget the term, you, so you don't get really disoriented by it. And so although I never say, I would never say go out, find a fight and get hit in the face a few times, it's a very positive learning experience. If, if it happens in a dojo environment, it, it is, I've never had a kid seriously hit in the face or a student. Um, but it's a learning experience for them because most, most of our students have never been hit in the face. They've been hit other places, you know, just messing around. Um, but very rarely do they ever get, because we don't, we don't hit each other in the face. <laughs> it's, and and uh, so I don't know how you, you know, I don't know how you tell that to your students. I mean, that's what I do. I'm pretty straight up. I say, you know, you need, <clears throat> until you've been hit in the face once, uh, you really don't know how to deal with it. And uh, if you have, you're that much further ahead in the game, so to speak. Any other thoughts here or on, on padding or protecting? Uh, yes, sir. I, I wanted to, uh, I wanted to uh, back up what you were saying about getting hit, hit in a place, uh, in the face. Um, there was a quote by Mike, Mike Tyson. Everybody gets had a plan before they get hit in the mouth. Uh, so just, just having mouth guard, gloves, and just uh, training, to, uh, training to get rid of your, uh, your flinch response. It's a good way to to help um, help get you uh, situated for uh, for a, a uh, fight situation. Um, it's a, it's a good training to uh, so so you uh, if you're not used to getting hit in the face and you're flinching, you can't see what's going on. You can't defend yourself. Yeah, you you you. I mean, <clears throat> how do you say? In spite of your best blocking abilities, it can happen. And uh, once once students are in that situation, or once or when they have to deal with hits that are coming in really close to their face, they learn to be more effective in their blocking because most people have an aversion of being hit in the face or the head. Um, um, what else can I say about it? the the other thing, which is kind of humorous? Seki on rare occasion would. Uh, have all the male students line up on the mat and then he'd get out a handbow and kind of do a love tap to everybody's crotch. And he, you found out real fast who were, wasn't wearing a cup. <laughs> and uh, next class, everybody was wearing a cup. He, uh, he, had no, uh, he had no qualms about things of that sort. He says, you don't do stupid stuff. Okay. Tom, TJ. A related topic I suspect that may have some benefit is uh, the difference between a thin tatami and an actual landing pad for teaching people to break fall. Yeah. Um, I notice that uh, newer students respond well when we put them on, we have a, a six inch landing pad, but I notice that if I don't get them off of that and onto the thinner flooring, their falling techniques never really evolve much because the pad is comfortable. Right. Pad. right. So I think that especially apropos for jujitsu is we, what's our flooring? What are we falling on? What are we throwing on to? Right. The, the, the padding we use is designed for adults. It's about, it's, it's, the foam is actually a com it's uh, manufactured by a, uh, GSC, Gymnastics Supply Corporation. And it's actually a combination of two or three foams. Um, it's only about one and a half, one and three quarter inch thick, but it's made for adults practicing martial arts. Um, it's a hard mat, but it absorbs the shock. And th that's the key uh, is to, it, it has to absorb the shock. The, the problem, as you said, with soft padding is that it's nice to land on. Um, I jokingly tell my students, I said, I don't teach you how to fall. Mother nature has taken care of that. It's called gravity. Um, I teach you how to land. We're gonna start from the ground and work up. And they, they're, their first night, uh, they're on that hard padding. Um, 
and they they learn they learn soon they 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 learn how to break their falls because they have an avert you know it's it's a hard pad uh and i tell them it will absorb the shock of your falling but you want to land properly so that you don't land as hard <laughs> so anyway but, but the, the same concept i think applies to padding is that if it's if it's if the padding is too hard uh, i mean i've seen some solid plastic padding that you can wear i call it plastic but it's actually other materials and that's great i don't know if it's great for blocking because it, it creates a uh uh you lose the total feel of the impact, I think. So as you're saying, TJ, it's, you know, the, the surface you, that you're using for padding has a great impact on how effective it is as a learning device. Um, I, I've had I've had students that will practice break falls on bare floor, that'll practice throws on bare floor. Usually brown belts, because they're the crazy ones. Uh, <laughs> And they don't get hurt. They do it to show off, and they can, you know, they control the throw so the person isn't landing hard. Um, and that's well and good. It's a good. I think it's a good experience. Um, but then again, you don't want new students practicing on hard floor because it might damage the floor. Uh, and one thing I've always mentioned is I never. How do you say it? It's it's like don't damage the floor you never say something you know don't do that or another student's or the, your partner's going to get hurt there has to be some inanimate object that gets damaged as a result of whatever you've done you know if you if you hit if you swing too hard you're going to damage the padding the padding in your forearm pads yeah and that's not a reality but, but students can laugh at that but they get the point so don't damage the floor uh, okay, anything else on, on uh, padding or armoring or protective gear? Sensei, I just have two, two brief follow-ups. Um, one is, um, as a sensei, uh, you're a leader. As a leader, you at times will find yourself being a target. I did have one student um, through the years who uh, had anger issues and um, was going to make an example out of the sensei by uh, a direct kick to the crotch during Randori. Uh, it was three-person randori um, and uh, made me a, a slightly more susceptible target. And uh, it was a straight kick to the crotch. Um, this student ended up hurting their instep a lot worse because uh, um, I had my shock doctor on. And um, <laughs> that was the end of that. Uh, that never got attempted again. Um, anyways, um, I share that story because um, it, it's, it's worth noting. And the other uh, is in our, our dojo, whenever we do any form of randori, one-on-one uh, -on -one, um, uh, grappling, uh, I uh, have uh, two sets of knee protection that have the metal running down the side that is covered up by padding, but it, it's solid knee protection. Um, Logan had a, 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 an experience uh, in, in the, that uh, he actually... Uh, had a what would have been a hyperextended knee. Logan, well, yeah, you want to show sure. you what? Yeah, you you you, you had you had a hyper it would have been a hyperextended knee. I said, Logan, what would have happened if, if you didn't have that knee protection on? And, and you said it wouldn't have been good. It's it many years ago. And I have to Dave, <laughs> anyway, Dave, I'm curious. Uh, what? How did you handle the student who tried to kick you in, or did kick you in the groin during Rondori? Uh, there was there was a talk after class, not during class. Uh, this this student, um, I, I know the background. This student comes from a, a broken home and it has been abused um, um, a number of ways uh, growing up, and um, has a good heart and has demonstrated kindness uh, and the capacity to, to to really work hard, and um, and and uh, so. Uh, Normally, <laughs> I would have uh, um, explained that you need uh, you need to look at the door and uh, and, and go, uh, and don't come back. But in this situation, that would not have been the appropriate thing to do. 
and, and that the student did continue to excel and, and be a, a, a very positive contributor for the class. So uh, it was just, just something that um, I, I, uh, I, I knew what was intended. What was intended was to make, a, make me um, less of a sensei and more of a, a target. Um, and um, so. Sounds like you handled it well. Uh, it, it had to be addressed uh, directly, but um, I, I did. Normally, I would have I would have also addressed it in class um, to make you know to make the point. This point needed to be made one on one. I, n I never went to the student's parents about it. Uh, the student learned that was that. But uh, again, on the knee protection, um, the knee is uh, is like a printer to a computer. <laughs> it's not supposed to work the way that they do. <laughs> and, the knees uh, are, are extremely vulnerable. Um, I, I suffered um, a couple knee injuries on the way to a couple black belts uh, that put me on crutches for a, a, a period of time. Uh, and uh, so uh, uh, my students know if, if they're gonna grapple one-on-one, uh, -on -one, they, they uh, take the moment to put on the, the knee protection, just slides right up, slides on, slides off. And um, um, it, it, it's, uh, it's, it's served us well through the year. Okay. Okay. Anyone else want to deal with this issue anymore? Okay. Uh, <clears throat> and I want to add uh, Jeff Wynn at uh, number one. He, I don't know how many of you read what I sent last, last night from Jeff Wynn. Uh, about once a quarter, we have a no gi no gi night to become familiar with no lapels or obi to grab. Um, the I'll do that once, maybe once a session, once every several weeks. I'll have students show up in street clothes and say, "Bring a couple extra shirts or a couple extra sweatshirts um, in case clothes get torn." Uh, because if we only train in in, in gi. It creates a false sense of security, um, and they need to learn how to fight street clothes or even even a, a t-shirt. Um, I actually, when I surprisingly, when I I had forgotten about this for years, that uh, you know you can take a t-shirt and put it over the other your opponent's face with just one hand, or actually just one take. I learned this when I had my right my shoulder replacement surgery and they said do you know how to take your shirt off with t-shirt off with one hand and i said yeah you just reach it over the back of your head and grab the back of the t-shirt and pull it over and that makes a great self-defense technique <laughs> because if they can't see you know just pull that shirt over their face they can't see what's going on okay and, and i hate to say you know stupid is as stupid does but some of it, we, we tend to miss some of the really simple things in terms of fighting effectively. Um, and you can, as he says, uh, also uh, uh, choking a, a, a person with their own T-shirt, okay? And that can work effectively up to a point, okay? Depending on how you grab the T-shirt, depending on the quality of the T-shirt, Okay, if, if a person's wearing a really good quality t-shirt, you can use it really effectively before it tears. Um, on the other hand, I've seen, you know, where I've, I've seen a jujitsu student tear a shirt off a person. And that in and of itself can be intimidating in a street situation. Because all of us, you know, for one moment, you know, one part is you got this tough guy who's wearing it. Well, he thinks he's a tough. He's wearing a t-shirt. He's all buff. You block the hit, and then they come in to try it to do a throw, and he's wearing a really cheap t-shirt. And you basically rip the t-shirt off, and there he is standing there with nothing on top. And sometimes that'll stop a fight real fast, uh, <laughs> and it's a, a surprise to the Tory as well as a you know the, the defender as well as the attacker. Um, Anyhow, I think we, we've hit that and you know, so maybe some of you can start playing around with defending yourself with your partner's t-shirt. 
or other articles of clothing. Um, suit jackets. Uh, 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 really quick on, on that uh, choking someone with a with a t shirt. Uh, there is a way to to make it uh, more effective so the shirt does not not tear. And that's uh, if if you go for for uh, if you go for a cross collar choke. You, you, you grab the uh, basically the back of, uh, of the shirt. You reach over, bun, uh, grab the, the uh, uh, as low as you can the uh, the rest of the shirt uh, right. from the back. Bring it up, bunch it up. Now you have a much stronger uh, shirt. Now you can do a cross collar choke. Right, and you can grab the other end of all that shirt. And now you've got something you can really hold on to. Exactly. Right. Yeah, I mean it's it's. I think the trick with self-defense techniques for the street is to keep it as simple as possible because the, the, the complex stuff goes down the tubes real fast. Okay, let's move on here. Real gun. Now this is again from Gary Whitus. Uh, I said if other guy draws a gun, I have to end it, charge a gun, run from a knife. Um, they may just move, be moving the gun around to impress you. I have to assume lethal intent. Um, and I'm gonna to refer to uh, Jeff Wynn's comment. There, there are many gun defenses in case. Some are good, some are questionable. Um, I know that if you you can grab a what doesn't matter where the semi-automatic is, <clears throat> I say right in your face or stomach or a foot in front of you. If you can grab the barrel and prevent the uh, the mechanism from working, it will it will jam the weapon when the attacker fires, assuming he has a round in the gun, assuming the gun works anyway. Um, the only downside is that if it does fire, you're going to get some great burns, great second degree burns on your hand because the uh, uh, shell has to escape from someplace. All that hot gas coming out of the weapon is, has to go somewhere and it's going to end up in the middle of your hand if you're not careful. Uh, as far as a revolver is concerned, um, if you can grab the, the uh, cylinder, you can prevent it from firing. A great learning experience, which I've had, was I ended up once with a, with a firing pin in my little finger. Okay. Um, I stopped the gun. I mean, it was a training, not a real gun. I mean, it was a real gun, but not a real situation. Um, and that that hurt like hell and it was a, it was a really bloody mess um and uh, but fortunately it didn't break any bone but uh you know the, you, if you block if, if you prevent a gun from firing you, you still have to face the realization there's a good chance that you're going to sustain some type of injury but it's better than being shot uh, I guess everything's relative. The other thing in working with a gun and, and um, is I know we tend to work with plastic guns, rubber guns, uh, replica guns in bright yellow or bright red or whatever they are. Okay. Um, if you can do it once in a while, do it with a real weapon. Okay. It's a whole different ball game when you're dealing with a real weapon, which has sharp edges, uh, which moves and things of that sort. And if a student, if you can get, you get your students to train with a real weapon, they, they develop a much greater appreciation for the and respect for the weapon. And, and that is so essential uh, when facing any type of weapon, knife, gun, rope ballpoint pen. Um, there's also the reality that sometimes, and I hate to say it, but it's, it isn't uncommon 
a person who pulls a gun on you, uh, the gun doesn't function, or they don't, or it's unloaded, or they don't have the correct caliber <laughs> bullet. <laughs> I've seen it happen. <laughs> I've seen that one happen, and. <laughs> Um, so there, there are a number of possibilities. Um, anyone else want to make any comments on guns or how to deal with them? Uh, yeah, gun, gun defense is a uh, controversial subject. You have people that swear, that swear on gun defense and those that, uh, that have after experience, uh, they they would say something like it's uh, it's a good idea to know what to do, but always try to uh, uh, find cover or, or safety. Um, if someone is if someone is at a uh, close enough distance to where you can grab them, uh, most likely they just want they just want your wallet. And yeah, give it to them. <laughs> yeah, I say if, if they, they can they can have every, anything they want except me. Exactly. Exactly. Now, uh, what I've read from uh, from other um, from others is that if they are asking to move you to another location, or they're trying to force you into another location, that's when you're in true danger. They uh, they want you to do some something bad to you. Um, uh, but oftentimes, what we have been seeing in uh, uh, if, if it's not if it's not a uh, uh, a mugging or, or whatever, whether it's a knife or, or a gun, they, they want your wallet. Your, uh, your, your wallet can be replaced. Money can be replaced. You can't. So uh, just give them what they need, back away, and just go home state. Uh, unless they, they're trying to force you uh, 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 someplace that you have no clue uh, uh, what it is or what they want to, what they want to do, you're, in, in, you're really in danger. Uh, another scenario is uh, oftentimes a, a lot of these uh, shootings have been happening uh, uh, and it's just everything's at a distance. You need to find cover. Don't bother trying to uh, be a hero. Just uh, get you and your family safe. Um, now, if someone is is trying to uh, uh, to cause great uh, body, body harm with, uh, uh, with a firearm, and they are close enough, you need to close that, that distance and get off the line, uh, the line of fire. Uh, so if, if the line's here, just that, just that, it's just an, it's getting off the line uh, by this much, by a few inches, it's just, just enough to get you, uh, to keep you safe. And you need to take control of, this, of the situation. By this time, you need to be very aggressive and you're fighting for your life. Um, but again, I go back to um, to that point that I was making. If someone is uh, if someone is demanding your, your wallet or your credit card, just give it to them. Uh, uh, your your life is more uh, it's worth more than a wallet. Right. The as far as the line of sight, that's one reason. I, I say that's where body movement really comes into play, or actually your footwork. Because the fa fastest way to get your body out of the line of fire is to move your one foot or the other back in a, in a half circle because it will get your body out of the way. Um, anything else you do is going to take a lot more time. And it also puts you in a better position to uh, trap the weapon if, you know, that should be your goal as well. Um, uh, there used to be, as if you were running from someone who could fire at you, uh, it, the, the thinking used to be that if you zigzag back and forth, you could avoid being a target because they constantly have to readjust. But then someone at University of California, San Quentin, UCSQ, um, determined that all you have to do is hold the weapon still and the person will keep crossing the line of fire and that's when you shoot so the the alternative now is if you're trying if you're running away you know, your wide open spaces in the middle of ohio or wherever, kansas let's say kansas um is to run in a 
to run in an arc because then they have to constantly change the direction in which they're aiming. Um, I mean, this is all kind of, you know, I don't know whether it's relevant to anything or not, um, but that's, you know, that's, if, if you're running from a weapon, a person with a gun, don't, don't run in a straight line, don't zigzag, run in an arc. Um, and that may save your life. Any, anything else on, on guns? Uh, yeah, I, I, I think the, you know, from a holistic approach, I mean, from a curricular kind of standpoint, is that you've got to develop the, the gun defense from, you know, all, the multiple ranges. You know, there's the, the seek shelter range, you know, right. they may not see, they may not see you, uh, but, but you see them. And then there's the talking, there's the talking range where the gun is on you and you're out of contact distance. So you have to use that other martial arts skill. Uh, I don't know how effective the de-escalation part of that, right? And then as you move closer and closer in, then you, you know, you've got to, you've got to add those layers uh, to your, uh, your teaching strategy, as well as your, uh, your, your offensive stra defensive strategy. Right, right. Yeah, it, there's, there's no, how do you say, uh, as, as Eric said, the easiest thing is to give them what they want, unless it's your body, uh, or unless they want to take you to what's called the uh, uh, secondary scene of the crime, which is usually where the bad stuff really happens. Uh, where you're at is the primary scene of the crime. Uh, but uh, you, you basically give them what they want. But if, if you if you have to defend yourself, you've got to be, the, the key to the gun defense is you have to be close enough to easily secure possession of the gun. Um, same thing applies to a rifle, although you have to deal with it a little differently. Um, you, you have to be close enough. And that's, that's the hard part. Um, so give them what they want and go home. The rest of Kirby, the other thing too is I think that, you know, uh, you, you can't watch a movie, an action movie. And, and I, I, I ran on this uh, to uh, a Jackie Chan or uh, Rush Hour. <laughs> you know, the rush hour or those, uh, those type of uh, defense where, you know, they're disassembling the gun, <laughs> you know, um, and it's, a lot of people think that that's very easy, easy to do. And they would that they want to try it when they get they get a, uh, uh, a, a, a gun, in, a, a gun in terms of uh, um, a self-defense situation, uh, which I always caution against. <laughs> yeah, I used to have. I still have it someplace. Um, I actually have two real automatics. One, and I never purchased either of them. I don't know how I got either of them. Um, one has a has a pin going through the barrel, and I have a feeling I picked that up in Canada when I was working with a, a police agency up there. And someone put it in. It, it was, we were doing gun disarms, and and they. Uh, uh, you know, they, they'd come into the training center and they'd have to fire their weapon into a you know, metal barrel a couple of times just to make, to prove to everyone the gun was unloaded. Um, and I have a feeling that one of them put their own weapon in my bag, which somehow made it through the airport and everything. <laughs> but anyway, anyway, the other one was an old 45 that literally... I can reassemble it. It would literally fall apart in your hands. It was so, it had been abused so much. And I would use that occasion of self-defense to do the Jackie Chan routine. I just drop their hand, take the weapon, and it would fall apart in my hands. And everybody would be so amazed. <laughs> but that's not reality. Uh, <laughs> and, 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 uh, it's amazing. So sometimes you have to go with the flow. If you're side, this is a segue into a demonstration. Years ago, uh, if I'm doing a demonstration, I will use a real knife. 
okay, the, the, the edges ground down so it's dull, but the point is still there. And uh, one of my black belts was doing a tenagi on me. A knife flew out of my hand, up into the air, came down. I landed on top of it. I get up, okay. The knife blade is has gone through the mat into the ground, which surprised the audience as much as it did me. I'm glad the knife wasn't pointed the other way. Um, <laughs> but my response was, you know, the, the other black belt looked at the knife in the mat and I did too. And I, my comment was, do you think the mat will live? Um, and we pulled the knife out and continued on. Uh, <laughs> but... <laughs> You, you do, if you're using real weapons, you do have to be careful um, because there are sharp edges. It doesn't matter what you do, whether it be a gun or a rifle or um, a knife. Even, even, you know, even the guard is going to have sharp edges that can injure a student or you. So you have to be careful with all this stuff. Uh, but anyway. Okay, where are we here? Let's take, uh, anyone else have a comment on guns or? I have one uh, one last quick comment uh, regarding uh, gun self-defense, especially if you want to, to train in a more simulated environment. Um, uh, of course, have, uh, have safety glasses and, and, and other safety for, uh, uh, for your face. Uh, you, there are uh, firearms that you can, uh, that you can push this that is uh, I'm forgetting the name of the the sport. It's basically um, these are real firearms or that are converted to uh, uh, there could be a compression or or, or, or a mechanical spring. Uh, it's soft stem, I think it's it's what yeah, it's I called. Think it's, yeah, I've heard of, I've heard of it. Soft. Right, and yeah. uh, you can uh, you can uh, use those uh, uh, those firearms to practice your self defense techniques. Uh, if if you get pegged, well, it didn't work, and you uh, you keep uh, practicing until uh, you can be certain that be certain that that you're uh, you're uh, clearing yourself from the line of fire, and being able to uh, secure the uh, the firearm with, without. Getting uh, shot with those those little pellets, and that that's one way to uh, to practice, and it gives you a, a much better sense of reality. Uh, now, do keep in mind uh, the speed of a of a of a bullet, uh, especially with with gunpowder, is a lot faster than a pellet. That's what uh, that that's the uh, the real reality, and it's more dangerous, but. <laughs> You do want to uh, train as safely as you can in a more realistic fashion. One, going, going back decades, just to be back into the 70s, uh, we were doing a demonstration in a local mall and uh, one of the other black belts was a, uh, a sheriff with, uh, I think, the uh, Santa Barbara Sheriff's Department. And he was using a service weapon and he did, you know, he, he loaded his own blanks and he used very little powder. So there'd be very, very, very slight discharge of, of powder, which are normally is anyway, even if you're firing a blank. Um, I don't know what, why, what possessed him to use that as a, for, for, as a demonstration weapon in a mall. Um, he fired off two shots. Within three minutes, the place was surrounded, was packed with police uh, <laughs> because someone had called in. Shots fired in a mall. Uh, <laughs> so if you if if you are doing a demonstration, you know it is it is, uh, and you, and you use a real weapon in any form or manner, it is so important that you announce to the audience what is going to happen what equipment is being used, okay? And if it's in a public place, such as a mall, that the security there also is aware of that because uh, uh, today things have gotten, in some places, very paranoid 
uh, in terms of what happens. Okay. Um, yesterday at one local high school, there was an intruder on campus. They locked the school down because of that. Uh, when I taught, if you had an intruder on campus, they would just be confronted by a, either the school security team or school police or whatever else, you know, it might even be one, you know, the, one of the schools I taught at, this is before you had school police, we had our own security team, which was made up of me, a karate black belt, a bouncer, and the boys PE department. And it didn't get announced. There wasn't a lockdown, you know, and I, I don't know whether we, today we are overreacting, which is not helping our kids' psyche either. Um, you know, so anyway, that's my two cents <clears throat> worth. But um, let's move on. We got to find something. Uh, okay, all the martial arts, mats are so soft and smooth. <laughs> Where? Uh, <laughs> I, I have never, I have never been on a soft mat. <laughs> uh, um, alleys and streets are not mats are different from the street. Um, we, I think we've. I, I know some of you have different mat setups. Um, I know Dave Clark has a. Real has one area of his mats that's really soft. Um, I've seen some dojo where they will have the regular mats on the floor. Then if they're doing something like a uh, karate maki komi body winding throw or tomonagi or some of these heavy heavy duty throws, um, where they'll execute it so that the poor uke lands on the very soft padded area, which may be a six inch six inches of foam matting or something of that sort. Um, any any comments on matting? Um, one other thing which I think is related is that, and I have a student in uh, Sweden who's just learning and he only has, uh, his mat area is 2.2 meters per side, which is about eight feet. Um, and some students, I know some sensei will break up their mats so the students only have like a six by six foot area or eight by eight foot area and then it's hard floor. And they learn very fast how to control their throws because landing on the floor is not a pleasant experience. Um, I've never seen a student get hurt other than it really smarts um, if they're falling correctly. But um, the, the, the key with jujitsu techniques is you want the person to land at your feet. You don't want to have to go chasing after them because who knows what you want to do to them afterwards. Um, but I, and there are other situations where I've seen where they will give students all the space they need to do a throw, which I don't know whether that's the correct way of letting a student learn either. You know, so um, I guess the issue is what do you want students landing on? No, any response or? I can, uh, I can uh, dem uh, describe what, uh, Myself and my my training partner uh, are using. Uh, I'm I'm uh, mainly training at uh, his uh, his location, and what we have is a uh, garage converted into a dojo. So uh, there is concrete on 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 the floor, and we had the uh, the old uh, judo mats, uh, tatami mats, and uh, they work uh, uh, very effectively. Unfortunately, uh, what they say, um, the bigger they are, the harder they fall. It is true, uh, <laughs> because I'm I'm uh, uh, because of the holidays, I gained a few poundage. Uh, 
So I'm over. Uh, I'm about 260 right now. If uh, if I get thrown with that with the big throw, uh, if I'm Sanagi or um, had I go see, doesn't matter. If I'm thrown on onto that mat, um, it hurts a lot more for me than it would for uh, my training partner uh, Chris. And uh, there's also that size difference. I can hold him up a lot more and help him absorb the uh, the impact more. But he has uh, a lot more difficulty doing that for me. So uh, uh, on on top of on, on top of just the general uh, mat area that we have, we have two other mats that we use. Uh, one uh, one I bought off of, of off of Amazon. It's like a uh, instant uh, instant a quarter mat. Uh, I was going to use that for uh, for my own. Like the, the, it had velcro, so I can add multiple mats and. Combine them in to to make um, uh, a larger mat area, but uh, it's, these are softer mats, and uh, it just help uh, absorb my my impact, uh, so I don't uh, so I don't break the concrete. But uh, uh, yes, we we use uh, on testing we use that in, uh, instead of the uh, the craft pad, which is about. I would say uh, eight inches, and um, uh, that's another mat that we used. Uh, but back, back to the, uh, the testing, uh, because it's uh, a lot lower to the ground, uh, we would use the uh, um, the inch and uh, inch and a half, or inch and a quarter, uh, uh, three quarters, inch and a three quarter uh, mat. It would help uh, soften my landing, but it's low enough to the, to the ground where. Uh, Chris can transition to uh, uh, groundwork, Navaza, or uh, any kind of uh, ground submission uh, a lot easier than he would with a, uh, uh, a larger crash pad. Now, if you're, if you're doing uh, uh, throws in general, like, like judo type throws, uh, we would use the, uh, the crash pad so we can just keep going and and not uh, wear ourselves out from landing on uh, a much harder surface. Uh, but yes, uh, what, what, uh, what Sensei George has mentioned is if you're being in that uh, small of a, of a space, you learn how to control your, your, th your throwing techniques as, uh, as best as you can. So I'm not, uh, I'm not throwing uh, Chris to a wall or the garage door and, and we're trying not to um, uh, damage the house or make it fall down on us. So, <laughs> yes, we uh, we need to keep ourselves safe too. So uh, that's uh, that's our experience. There, there, there are two other mats that I've had experience with. Uh, one was uh, uh, for a while. Seki had his own dojo. Uh, he took over the lease on a building and. What he used for a mat was uh, the yellow pages from telephone books for Los Angeles, which they were about three inches thick. And he put a whole bunch of those down on, on the floor, put a canvas mat over it, and then secured it with two by fours around all the way. That actually turned out to be a really great mat. Um, it was hard to land on, but it really absorbed the shock. The, the other one, which was a, to a totally other experience, I think, was at the Eagle Rock YMCA. We went there once for a uh, freestyle kata tournament, and they had us use the uh, gymnastics floor, um, which was really different because you threw the person, and because it's a very bouncy floor, they would bounce right back up into a standing position. So it made Nawaza or groundwork, absolute or submissions on the ground, absolutely impossible to do in this competition, and everybody had to readjust real fast uh, to deal with that. And uh, uh, so, what you know, what you land on is really important. Um, and uh, as I said, I think earlier, it's it's not the thickness of the mat, but the type of foam that's used uh, to make up that thickness. And that's what you, if, if you know, you're going out and getting mats, you have to be very careful about that. Um, 
there are some standards somewhere which I had a, a, an instructor who came and said that our, our mats were not acceptable if, for use according to whatever standard that I, you know, state or, or school district standard. That I've never heard of that criteria before because uh, they weren't thick enough. And I couldn't get him to accept the concept that it doesn't matter how thick the mat is, it's what kind of foam is used in that thickness. But anyway, so it's just something you, you have to be aware of. Lonnie? Yeah, I think one of the things I, I would caution from personal experience, a torn ACL, <laughs> is, uh, is working on a wrestling mat. Wrestling mats are so soft and you have super traction. And so you cannot adjust your, your body um, uh, to avoid damage. And, uh, and uh, this happened when someone grabbed me from the rear and I was going to drop down and grab the leg, <laughs> you know, but my, my leg was kind of locked in place because it was weight, weight bearing. And so all of a sudden, just a little movement and that I heard something say pop. Didn't mean anything until we disengaged and then I couldn't support myself on my left side of my body, you know, but my leg was trapped on the wrestling mat because wrestling mats are just so super soft. And so, cause we, we had the advantage when I was working at the university to use the wrestling room cause we didn't have our own room. We had to share space. Yeah. So that was just a danger. Yeah. Seki's, when Seki was at Valley college, um, it was actually a double thickness of wrestling mat, but that mat was hard. Um, I, I guess they come in different types of density or whatnot, you know, uh, but that mat, even with two thicknesses of wrestling mat, it was, and we had to roll them up after class. Um, I don't know why, considering it was a wrestling room. Uh, <laughs> I guess so the wrestlers couldn't roll it and then roll it back up. Um, Sometimes educational institutions or, or teachers or de school departments have weird rules that don't mean anything. <laughs> um, and, and, yeah. and, and then again, this could have been just a, you know, just a vintage, a vintage wrestling match, yeah. mat, you know, that was in place. <laughs> yeah, the, the other extreme, one of the other extremes I've seen is people working out, oh, they'll put the bed mattresses together. And, and I just tell them, it may absorb the shock, but you're just asking for foot and ankle injuries um, because you, you can't move around. Uh, your feet sink into the mattress and that's not safe. Um, anyway. So I'd say a couple of things I could uh, add to this might be worth sharing. Um, on our way to black belt and karate and, and jiu-jitsu, we worked on one inch thick wrestling mats free. Like you, uh, like your experience, they were very firm. And um, so I dreamed up a mat system that we've used through the years that uh, is uh, 12 by uh, 20. And what happens is uh, what I did was I combined firm and soft, went down and bought S12S, four inches thick S12S foam. And that sat inside a, a two by six um, that was bolted together. And um, on top of the uh, four inches of S12 S foam, which is so soft, it's like walking on a cloud, I put 11 32nd inch thick plywood Velcroed together. And on top of that, I bought very firm um, um, cross-link polyethylene foam mats. So I had ended up with a six inch thick floor, floating floor. And the firmness of the uh, cross-link polyethylene foam mats and the firmness of the plywood uh, worked to our advantage and the S12S underneath did a lot of shock absorption. When right. we did hard, hard high falls um, and watched them in slow motion, you could see the body land and see the shock wave go out and it was like an epicenter. It was the coolest thing to see. So you could see the mat system actually working, absorbing the shock, but we still had a firm floor, uh, a firm mat to, to, to work on. It was a nice combination of firm and soft. And it, it's worked very well through the years uh, for us. Um, and uh, um, 
So the, the, the drawback I would say is that it, it, it set me back a pretty penny. It cost just over two grand right out of my pocket to put this in place. It's, it, it's been a dream to work on. Yeah, I, I, I think the important thing is that, that you, if you're teaching particularly jujitsu or any technique that involves throws, uh, or the issue is any martial art that involves having people land <laughs> not on their feet um you have to consider what type of surface they're landing on and make sure it's a safe surface uh, where we are in the park we we've had classes we have the uh mats are put down on concrete if if and I, i've often said this park people can't you get us a facility where even there is industrial carpeting on the floor because that industrial carpeting really improves the shock absorbency of the mats. And uh, they haven't been that kind to us yet. Uh, but, you know, what can you do? But that, that's, that's, that's probably one of your greatest safety concerns in the dojo is to have a safe workout area um, where, you know, the risk of injury or you've minimized that particular risk of injury. Okay, um, I want to hit one more topic, and then we're going to leave it there. Then we, we we also need more topics because we're 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 down to three left after this next one, which is don't carry weapons. Um, does anyone? No, there's who is it? Uh, uh, Again, I'm a draw on uh, uh, Jeff Wynn, who teaches uh, self-defense and for women, and he provides each of them with a stainless steel ballpoint pen, which I guess the TSA deems acceptable to take on a plane, um, or is Kubotan or not. Um, And a weapon is relative. I, I had a, a, a black belt once who, in an act of sheer stupidity, um, I guess he was carrying a kubotan, and the TSA took it away from him. And then he said, I can use my belt as a weapon too. Do you want my belt? He ended up on their no fly list. <laughs> <laughs> the, <laughs> the, the you know uh i don't advise anyone to carry weapons because you know i mean i mean if you're going to carry a ballpoint pen surprisingly i have a ballpoint pen uh, stainless steel but in the top part of it it's also it's also there's a, a about a three inch blade it's but it's all it's a ballpoint pen and I've never been stopped by TSA when I've flown. I, I, sometimes I'll have it in my pocket, you know, somewhere. It's not hidden and no one ever, or I've just put it in a tray with everything else and no one questions it. Um, the absurdity being that, you know, if you're, if you're a creative martial artist, you can use almost anything as a weapon. Um, you can do a lot of damage to a person with a plastic spoon. Um, George, you just brought up, uh, you mentioned TSA. And one, one thing I've been working on in the last months is cane, the use, the use of cane as a self-defense device. And the, the person I work with mainly, I work with Al somewhat and also Mark, Mark Shuey, who does exclusively cane. And he's, he's a big touter of having a cane because you can bring them on planes. Um, this, you know, this is an example of one that might not get on a plane because it has this, it has a pointed horn to it, but that's, that's one advantage of, uh, canes, especially as we get older, we think of them as just mobility devices, but they have a lot of self-defense potential. It is, it, it is amazing how much you can carry on you if you're trained that you can use as a weapon, but most people fortunately use good judgment or they're ignorant of what their potential is. Um, 
and uh, um, to me, the problem of quote unquote carrying a weapon is that sometimes the other person's attorney can establish uh, prior intent that you were carrying that weapon with the intention of using it. And therefore, even though you were the victim, you can then be, they can challenge you as being the aggressor. You know, you were out looking for a fight or you were out looking for someone to mug you or whatever you want to call it. I mean, uh, that's why you have attorneys in the US. Uh, I'm not knocking them. I mean, because as, as I would tell my students, if you're accused of a crime, get the best attorney you can, you can afford because all that attorney has to do is create reasonable doubt in the mind of one juror and you walk. <laughs> they don't have to prove that you didn't do it. Um, and that's a shock to a lot of people because they think that, you know, you, either person's found, the judge says not guilty, not the jury. Uh, unless all of them say not guilty, but uh, uh, if you get one juror who accepts reasonable doubt, then they have to uh, say the person is, is not guilty. Uh, so you don't want to give your attacker that option. Uh, years ago when I I had to deal with a student who was on drugs, who I'd restrained, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It ended up, he had, we ended up in court and he had a felony assault charge against him. And the uh, attorney attempted to make me the aggressor because I had put this kid who was taller than I was into a control hold and that caused him pain and therefore he was justified in attacking me when he had the opportunity to do so. Um, what saved me was that I was able to explain how a control hold worked and that if he had not resisted, there would not have been any pain and the judge bought it. Um, but you don't, you know, attorneys will do what they can to get their, their client off the hook. And you have to be prepared. And you, if, you know, you have to be able to come up with a really sound argument for whatever you did in terms of self-defense uh, if you're challenged. Uh, it isn't as simple as the Wild West. Anyway, um, Anything, anything, anyone else want to do with that? Let's say, uh, yes, I'll mention, okay. mention one thing. Uh, there are as many weapons, at least as many weapons on, on any airplane as there are seats on an airplane. Yes. Because in front of your seat is a Sky Miles magazine. If you roll that up very tightly, you got you got a pretty a pretty stalwart Kubaton. Yes. Or, uh, almost a Hanbo. <laughs> yes. And the rolled it, up it, magazine it is, is definitely a... Uh, uh, a weapon in the right hand. So, yeah. Right. Even even that folded up thing that displays the airplane. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, it's just amazing what you know, or a cup of coffee, or a, a, a cup of ginger ale. You know. Um, Another really nice coupon is uh, one of those really small carry flashlights. Yes. You, yeah. Not only can you can you blind blind uh, your attacker, now you can use that as a as a striking uh, uh, enhancer, or you can use it for a pressure point like a kubaton. Right, and I I normally have one of those in my backpack when I get on a plane as well. Um, I I guess you know it comes down to intent and and. Uh, uh, what it's there for. One, one thing to be aware of, and I, I did some research on this, that I, I, the flashlight I have, I don't know what the number of lumens is. It, it's, it's really on the high bright side. It's two or 3,000, I think it's two or 3,000 lumens. It's you know, more brighter than most of these little flashlights. And um, my concern was that 
I had been quote unquote taught before that if you shine bright light, you know, in someone's eyes, it can damage your retina, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that's not true. It can make, it can blind them momentarily. It can put spots in front of their eyes. But if <coughs> the sun, the, the number of lumens that come off of the sun, which can blind you, if you look at it for more than, you know, I don't know how, a second or two uh, directly, um, anything we produce that goes in front isn't, isn't going to be bright enough to cause any damage. It just causes temporary sensory damage. So if you if you can get it in someone's eyes, or even better yet, if you've got a little button on the end that allows it to flash on and off real fast, unless the person suffers from epilepsy, <coughs> um, and there is a form of epilepsy where flashing lights can cause them, a person to have a, you know, a epileptic fit, um, it can be tremendously disorienting because it messes with their vision. Uh, I think one of the last summer camps I did, we, we dealt with flashlights and, and it's, I go into more detail on, on that whatever light is coming out of a, a flashlight isn't going to cause any damage, retinal damage, because it's not, it's not bright, it doesn't have enough lumens to do that. It just causes temporary uh, malfunctions. <laughs> You know, but that's all you need in terms of defending yourself is a temporary malfunction. Um, anyhow, anything else on, on flashlights or weapons or? Uh... Professor, um, if I might, and I apologize that I've been in and out. This has been an unusual day. I keep getting pulled away. Um, I, I wanted to say this earlier on the weapons thing, the, the gun disarms in particular. One of the challenges that we have found over the years uh, in teaching pistol disarms from the front at close range specifically uh, is most of what I was taught and what I have taught is assuming a either police or military tactical scenario where the person that has the gun drawn on them also has a gun. And I have not yet figured out how to make the mind shift change in training gun disarms or responses to where the aggressor is coming, but they're not dealing with a police officer. They're not dealing with a soldier because all of those techniques assume that, that I've taught from, that I've learned from Krav Maga, Army Combatives, and, and Jiu Jitsu, that I also have a weapon. And so the assumption is they're going to probably use that weapon on me. And so feigning compliance and talking someone down really is a misplaced uh, response, in my estimation, in that tactical. And I don't know if anyone ha has wrestled with that, or maybe I'm classically overthinking it, but uh that that's are, difficult are you talking about the person has a gun on you and you also have a sidearm yeah so for example in in krav maga disarms or in army combatives the assumption is it's a combat scenario both of you are armed and it is going to be life or death with the weapon either you shoot them or they shoot you. I, I, I don't mean to make it so simple, but uh, whereas street encounters, uh, normal self-defense encounters, the, the, the assumption would be, I think, someone is coming to you with a weapon, but you're not carrying a pistol. You're not in a, in a combat theater. You're not in a law enforcement scenario. Right. And so I, I've struggled with, uh, one of my black belts um, was the leader of the, uh, the SWAT for the Illinois State Police. And we talked at length about this and, and his technique that he brought in and demonstrated very effective, but it all assumed that worst case scenario and aggressors coming to a police officer who also had a weapon and kind of a kill or be killed scenario. Okay, I mean, okay, I mean, I understand. I say I haven't, 
I've never looked at it that way because I haven't seen I haven't seen too many gun disarms that are one-handed to the extent where you could also draw your weapon mm -hmm. because the time it takes for you to draw your weapon how do you say it? you're thinking about two things you're trying to control this gun that's going to blow your head off and you're trying to get your gun out and fire back right and these particular scenarios that that i learned in army combatives and other scenarios were not they weren't necessarily one arm disarm one hand disarms but they were the the assumption was you are carrying a weapon yeah uh, the, the force continuum is at the max. Uh, lethal force is justified. Uh, you're disarming so you don't get killed. But I guess what I, what I re have wrestled with is, is that's a certain mindset. And my wife, for example, going to the grocery store, that's not her mindset. Is there a better way to teach? Or is it just you do the same thing and assume the worst, uh, but it, 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 she's not in a combat theater. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, what, what, one, of, one of the people that I work with is Professor Tony Maynard. Give him a little props out there, who, um, who was a combat, a hand, hand, hand combat instructor with the Marine Corps, and, um, but when he te when he teaches um, American combat jujitsu, which is a part of. Uh, AJA. I mean, he, he talks about it in the context, the environmental context, right? So when he's working with his police officers and the Le and Le the Leo community, that's a whole conversation in itself. But it's not to be confused with working with a civilian population. I think those are those you, you have to separate it out because one size does not fit all. You know, as a civilian, you don't have the 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 protection the protection of the protection of, of uh, using lethal force on someone, um, whereas in a, as a civilian, a civilian sense, I mean, that's not the sort right here. But uh, I guess uh, it, all, all I'm saying is that it's context specific right here. I think as an instructor, you, you, you have to be able to separate those out. Because if I'm working with mil if I'm working with law, law enforcement people and civilians in the same context, I'm always explaining to the Leo community, you know, what what they know separate that conversation from, from the civilian community, right? So we don't kind of get those those lines lines blur blurred. Even though you got enough hot shots out there in the civilian community <laughs> who will respond eggs eggs like egg, egg, uh, uh, with quick response uh, based on either stand your ground what, what they perceive as stand your ground. I'm in Virginia. We don't have a stand your ground law per se. But those are my two cents. Okay. <laughs> I, I think if, if and I know different different states have different laws, okay, <laughs> about use of lethal force. Um, my my thing and the way I've always trained my students is you remove you remove the weapon from the attacker, okay? You take your one or two steps back. If it's a revolver, you don't have to do much else. If, it, if it's a semi-automatic, you, uh, I forget what you call it, where you, you wanna, you wanna have a round go through the, through and out the chamber, exhaust chamber, okay? To make sure you're dealing with a loaded weapon. <laughs> properly loaded weapon because you know the, your mugger may not have a loaded weapon um and you give them a command of stay down and if they come at you with a loaded and they know you've got they they see the weapon that's in your hand and they know it's loaded um and you fear you fear for your i'm not an attorney here okay so 
This is not legal advice. If you fear for your life, you may be justified in shooting them. Okay. Uh, and where you ain't where you shoot, I will always tell my students go for the lower torso. Don't go for the head, it's a small target. Don't go for the upper body, you may hit something vital. Of course, other people may think lower torso is vital too, but um, that's what you aim for. You're not aiming for their face. Um, other states have different laws. Some states are a lot less restrictive than California is. Um, but you have to, you have to, you need to give the, the person a verbal, you need to give some sort of verbal command to the person before you do anything else, if you can. Okay. Because then you are, you know, quote unquote, you are in communication with them. <laughs> uh, um, and there may be other people around that are witnesses, either on your behalf or your attack mugger's behalf. Um, and it, it, it goes back to if you have if you have multiple assailants uh, and you go to the theory of how do you deal with multiple assailants, you may need to take your first assailant and either put them in a control hold and use them as a shield and create the illusion of enough pain where the others will back off or you have to do enough damage to the first person so the others will think, do I need, do I want to take this risk of being injured this bad as well? And unfortunately, these are all snap judgments you have to make at the time. Um, there's no simple answer. What do you do after you get the gun? Or what do you do, you know, in defending yourself? Um, what you have to be able to do is to be able to explain yourself clearly in a court of law if it goes that far. And that's, that's the really hard part. Um, so, and make sure you have a good attorney. <laughs> uh, but anyway, um, any, any other thoughts on this? I mean, is anybody, uh, Eric, you're in, you're in uh, the security profession. Are, are you armed? Do you carry a sidearm? Uh, no, sir. I never uh, I never applied for uh, uh, to carry a, a firearm. Um, for me, it's like uh, it, it's a couple of reasons. Number one, the, the the risk is not worth it, and it's only for like maybe a one or two dollar uh, pay raise. So it's never it's never been uh, worth it for me. Uh, plus, uh, plus the uh, the cost and fees to to not only get licensed, but you need to uh, do. Uh, I forgot the, the the rules. Uh, you have you have to have a, a certain amount of, of training uh, each year, like two, uh, like two, uh, uh, two tests a year for uh, for shooting, and you, and and you need to uh, you need to test. For, you need to apply for uh, basically, I think it's uh, four caliber, calibers, nine, 38, uh, 45, uh, and 357. So it, it, it's just it's just a lot uh, a lot to, to look into. Uh, so I just never bother with it. But th this is here in California, at least. Uh, 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 I I. I also, I am no longer in the in the security field. Um, I I actually got out of it this year. So, but I've had at least fifteen years of, of experience in, in security. Uh, but it's mostly unarmed security. Okay. Yeah. Sometimes it's sometimes it's just not worth it. I know when I after I got my master's degree, they they asked if I'd go for my doctorate, and I worked for the LA, LA unorganized school district. This is what we referred to it as. So it's so big. And what 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 does a doctorate get you? It got you fifty dollars more a month. And it just wasn't 
I say, as you said, it wasn't worth it. It wasn't worth the effort. And it, it didn't get you anything other than $50 a month uh, <laughs> for pay. <laughs> it's kind of like, you know, you're going to make a few dollars more if you're armed. You know, I, I could, uh, if, if I got my doctorate in, in social sciences, which would be basically in statistics anyway, which was not my area of interest, um, it just wasn't worth it. So I understand where you're, I understand where you're coming from. Um, any other thoughts before we, we close up today? Yeah, I'll pipe in. Can you hear me? Yes. So you just asked, is anybody carrying a gun? Um, yeah, I've got one on my hip right now. And the very first thing I do in the morning is I strap it on. Very first thing, I put my pants on, I strap my gun on, on my own property, in my own house. And then when I take it off at night, I put it on my nightstand and it's sitting there. So it's part of who I am. It's part of my identity. And I'll never leave the house without it. And I'm armed to the teeth and I bring extra ammo. I bring a fighting knife. I bring pepper gel because I know what's out there. In my lifetime, in my adult lifetime, I've been in seven gunfights. And I can tell you what it's like to go before a grand jury when you're sweating bullets. Like, am I going to be convicted? And um, it's something I take very serious because I know, like I said, what's out there. And there's a lot of guns out there and nobody has permits for them. And in Maryland, I'm in Prince George's County, and our murder rate right now is off the charts. So, and I've been up against guns you know, more times than I've had to shoot people because I've used de-escalation skills, pleading with them, begging with them, please drop the weapon, please drop the knife, please drop the gun as a police officer. Um, and I've been able to, um, you know, talk people out of pointing the weapon at me, but sometimes they don't give a damn and they just say, you know what, screw it. And my thing is, as a police officer and as a civilian, I think about the way they treat police, particularly recently, last night in New York City, two police officers were shot, one's dead, one's on life support. If they're going to treat police the way they're treating them now and on the West Coast as well, um, they don't give a damn about civilians. So for me to say, yeah, well, this person's intent is this or that, I try to hit them hard and fast right out of the gate because that's my best chance. And as a trainer, what we teach is the three elements for success. One is the element of surprise. They're expecting a very compliant victim. So I'm gonna hit them hard and fast from the gate. And secondly is speed and action or uh, the use of force and violence in that manner. And thirdly is sustained force so that I'm not gonna end, um, you know, maybe I beat this guy. I wanna make sure he's neutralized and, and I don't throw the word in, I wanna kill them. Uh, I would never utter that. It's like, I wanna protect myself and my loved ones. And then as a civilian, I have to operate within the rules of uh, the law, you know, the parameters of the law. But the big thing is that I want to win. And that's why my mindset is I'm going to take them out hard. I don't care about, well, maybe they've had a bad day. They just want to take my watch or my wallet. Um, you know, everyone has to uh, you know, be right with God and, and how they feel about morality. But <clears throat> excuse me, I don't cut them any slack unless they got me by surprise. And that's why, first and foremost, I teach uh, situational awareness. Forewarned is forearmed. You see it coming, then you can escape. But if I can't escape... They're going to be met with a response that they're not prepared for because I'm going to take violence to a level that they're not familiar with. And that's just the way I train. And uh, having been commissioned by the Department of State to teach counterterrorism with the Army and with law enforcement, uh, it, it's a pretty uh, different way of looking at things. But it's a real world. And the real world today has changed a lot from uh, when our parents were you know, young. Um, it's very violent. Uh, the legal system is on the side of the perpetrator. And as a victim... Uh, you know, you got to think about these things and you got to be prepared for it. So that's why, like I said, when I leave the house, uh, even in my backyard, I'm going to be armed. And, uh, my wife also has a concealed carry permit and we train and that's, uh, and I'm, you know, that's what I teach people. So that's my perspective. Um, and that's where I'm coming from. Okay. And, and I, I would support you. Um, uh, I, I think, on the one hand, we want we, we want as much as possible to do escalate things, um, and we're we're stuck. I say, civilians, I think, in law enforcement as well, are stuck with the concept of reasonable force. And you, I'm sure you know as well as I do that that usually gets determined after the fact. Um, exactly. And. Uh, it's 
you have to, how do you say, you have to keep in mind that you, you are allowed to, you are allowed to defend yourself. There's no one that's going to say you cannot do that. It's what you do in the process that whether or not it gets you in hot water or not. Um, yeah, there's an old police saying, uh, George, that says, you know, it's better to be judged by 12 than carried by six. It's real old school, but it's true. And I don't give a damn about lawyers because, you know, the first time I was in a shooting and a homicide detective came up to me, and he goes, what exactly happened, right? What happened here? And I said, I have no comment, sir. Um, my lawyer will present you with a, a, a prepared statement. And uh, I'll, I'll say this about police, you know, uh, from my perspective is most cops are really decent and they're on your side. But there's some cops that will put you in a trick bag. Uh, don't ever make an utterance when you have to be lethal force. Just you have a right. You have a Fifth Amendment right. Don't make a comment. Get your lawyer. Let your lawyer do your talking. And that's the best thing because they, they're trained at how to deal with all the legal jargon and BS because the justice system isn't always just. And anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. And I, I think what you're saying there is so important. And I've advised, I've said the same, I've basically said the same thing to my students, whether they be jujitsu students or students in, in my, when I taught history and government, if you're in any type of legal situation, keep your mouth shut. Wait until you've calmed down before you start thinking about what happened. And then as you say, write it down and rewrite it as many times as necessary until you are comfortable with what happened and then don't show that paper to anyone and as you said if if you think it's appropriate have an attorney uh and discuss it with your attorney don't give them the piece of paper <laughs> um you need to it is it is it is to me it is sad that the, the victim has to do and police officers have to spend so much time doing CYAs. And you, I'm sure you know what CYA means. Oh, yeah. Um, and, it, and it's really, uh, it, it's hard. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, like I said, you, <sighs> reasonable force is such a vague term. And, and, and that applies to you, whether you're a police officer, or if I, as a martial artist, supposedly you have to be more careful than a regular civilian, because for some reason the courts assume that you have a death touch or something. <laughs> and and uh, you really have to watch what you say and what you do. Um, and I have, you know, I've I've, I've dealt with people. As a teacher, I've dealt with you know, adults with weapons coming on campus, um, and and other low lives, and it's it's how you as you said it's how you approach them, it's how you talk with them. Um, in an attempt to de-escalate, but sometimes you just do not have that option. And uh, anyway. And that applies to, to all of us, even, even as martial artists, you know, we have to do our best. Anyhow, uh, did I get cut off here? For a second. Okay, we're still here. Okay, my computer went to sleep. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, so uh, I, Al, I want to thank you for getting in at the end. And uh, I hope in the future you'll be more outspoken, you know, with us because it's we 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 need different approaches. You know, different people have different experiences, and that's that's what I'm looking for on here. I'm not looking for sending out a single message, other than uh, you know we're all martial artists and we all have different backgrounds, and we're trying to come together, and uh, uh, we all have different experiences, and putting all that together is what makes us worthwhile. Because if someone watches this, they can make their own decisions. Um, but anyway, uh, <clears throat> our next meeting is on February 8th, I believe. Is it the next meeting is February. And uh, 
February, February, February 5th. I'm sorry, February 5th. Uh, I hope you'll join us. And uh, uh, like I said, we need some more topics because we're down to three. Um, otherwise, we'll have to drop down to maybe once a month or something of that sort. So again, uh, in the interim, I hope you all have a great day. I know it's kind of cold back east. Uh, meantime, it's Southern California here. And, uh, you know, someone said, why are there so many people in Southern California? And the answer was because the weather's generally better. And we also get more problems as a result. <laughs> anyway, so I hope everyone has a great weekend and we'll see you next week. I'm sorry that this session was as long as it was. Uh, and I'm sorry about the screw up at the beginning where I didn't have any audio. So uh, have a great weekend. Thank you, Sensei. Thanks to everybody else. Thanks. Yeah.